glad you could join us. We're going to get started in just a minute because we have uh, quite a bit of content that we want to just um, go through as the overview lay out the context for this group's work uh, and give you plenty of time to offer suggestions, ideas, questions, um, elevate concerns so that we know how to use the time together more productively than the time we meet. Um, Erica, will you help me watch the waiting room and admit? Um, <clears throat> we'll introduce ourselves in just a little bit while we're waiting for people to, um, to come online though. Um, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just share uh, some PowerPoint slides that will get us started in the context of what we are doing and why, um, where we're trying to get with this whole conversation. Um, let me see if I can, just, there we go. Um, uh, this is an advisory group that's going to help us think about how to safely restart Charleston County Schools. We are very, very anxious to get um, uh, underway. Um, the first couple slides, we'll just talk about uh, the context. Um, our agenda for today is to um, establish a kickoff session uh, our mission and guiding principles will be laid out. Uh, we'll introduce the task force members, provide some essential information from uh, the medical professionals who've been uh, working with Ellen Nitz, our nursing supervisor for the district. Um, Jeff Barrowe will share a little bit of work that's been done from the operations division. Carolyn Belcher and uh, Michelle Simmons, Joe Williams will do the same on the learning services side. And then we want to get to your questions, suggestions, concerns, um, and advice about how to move forward. So just quickly, the context within which we're working is, um, is our desire to get schools restarted. Um, we, we want to make sure that we have settings that are safe, that will allow teachers and students to re-engage in quality learning. Um, this, re this safe restart in August will let our students come back to some sort of normal routine and, and participate in um, uh, a more structured environment in learning activities that we think can be managed more effectively than simply through online learning. Um, we're not entirely sure today what normal will look like. We know it will not look like uh, schools when we closed on March 13th but we want to move forward establishing um, a routine uh, procedures, schedules that make the most sense in terms of the safety and the needs of our students, um, particularly those who rely on public schools to get things um, uh, organized and uh, taught to them. Um, our current reality, of course, is that uh, we've had a disruption in the education of about 50,000 students, as well as our, uh, our own staff members. That's not dissimilar to what any of you from another field have experienced in your lives the past two and a half months as well. Um, we know that many of our students have fallen behind academically. The Northwest Evaluation Association estimates that the learning loss in mathematics will at approximately a 70% learning loss. So we are especially concerned about um, getting students back, diagnosing where they are, and finding lessons that will accelerate their learning, picking up from where they left off and filling in some key uh, skills gaps. Um, fully operational schools are critically important to, um, to our students' well-being and to help our community return to uh, a new way of life. The work that we've done so far to start our Safe Schools Restart and aligns with federal, state, and local efforts. We sort of try to depict that here and we show it better on the next slide. Uh, the Accelerate SC and Accelerate Ed efforts are led by the governor and by State Superintendent Spearman. Uh, they are also connected with DHEC guidelines the reignite effort was led locally by Metro Chamber of Commerce and has some excellent suggestions 
for restarting um, our economy safely. And of course, our schools are a big part of our area's ability to do just that. So as we uh, turn to this task force mission, um, we want to emphasize that we need you to serve in an advisory capacity by reviewing the information and recommendations that um, our academic and logistics teams, our teachers, principals have put together, um, the best thinking that they've been able to elevate around what we think the challenges and responses might be. Uh, we really need you to offer insight into the approaches and direction based on the expertise that you bring to the table. And finally, as the plan begins to come together, we hope you'll feel comfortable act, um, advocating for uh, reactivating schools within our communities uh, as safe as quickly uh, as we possibly can. We will set for ourselves these five guiding principles. The first is vigilant. Uh, recognizing that we have to be always aware of changing surroundings, uh, changing data, changing conditions. So understanding that the plans that we make are always subject to modification. We will pledge that the decisions we make for children and our employees will be based on the best data that's available to us. And that's where the community um, is critical in helping us understand as much as possible about how COVID-19 spreads and the right protective measures that reasonably assure a, a safe environment. We want to take care to ensure equity to us. That means that we are very sensitive to the needs of children and families who rely most heavily on public education for a number of services, um, uh, including the basic instructional program, but supports beyond that as well. Uh, our fourth guiding principle is that we will establish and adhere to new standard operating procedures for safety. We know that DHEC and CDC will provide guide we need to, to um, translate those guidelines into a standard of care and standard operating procedures um, that on the engineered controls, the physical things that we can do, uh, and the administrative controls, the processes that we implement um, and monitor. And then finally, um, around what kinds of personal protective equipment that are A, needed, and be desired so that our students and teachers feel comfortable and feel well supported as we ask them to come back into learning environments. And then finally, we know we have to, to do a very careful job of communicating and that these are uh, difficult times to keep communication flowing, to keep accurate information, to keep up with new developments and to make sure that we are listening concerns and responding <clears throat> in timely and appropriate ways. I'm going to pause here um, and uh, remove the slides from the screen so that each of you can introduce yourselves, give you just a chance to look at the names on this screen. We have our board officers participating, uh, three individuals from MUSC, uh, Dr. Katie Richardson, who heads DHEC, we have um, multiple school principals uh, representing our elementary, middle, high school, and charter schools. We have teachers from various levels of our organization. We have two students who are participating uh, and uh, parents from different parts of the, the county, as well as some community members and business representatives. On the right-hand side of your screen, you see the names of the district leaders who are ultimately responsible for um, pulling all together. So I'm gonna stop share for a moment and just give each of you an opportunity to introduce yourselves to the group so we can put names and faces together. I should have said when we started that I'm Jerita Postalwaite, um, Superintendent of Charleston County Schools, and we are um, incredibly grateful to have given us this time um, to help with um, uh, what is likely the most important effort going on uh, in our district today with respect to the care of our children. Reverend Mack, do you want to begin the introductions? 
Can I hear you? Um, you're on mute, I believe. So, yes, absolutely. So I'm Reverend Eric Mack, uh, board chair, and I'm glad and excited to uh, be a part of this task force and joining with each and every one of you today. So thank you so much for participating. Thank you. And I'm just going to go across my um, uh, screen the way the pictures are displayed. Erica? Good morning. My name is Erica Taylor, Chief of Staff for Charleston County School District, and, and I welcome you all to being here with us this morning. Thanks, Erica. Jamie? Oh, um, good morning. I'm Jamie McCarthy. Um, I'm grateful the opportunity to work with this team and look forward to um, all the important work that we're going to be doing together. Ellen? Hi, I'm Ellen Nitz. I'm the Director of Nursing for CCSD. And I am very proud to say that um, CCSD has brought nursing into this picture from the very beginning. And we are so excited to have your partnership to make sure that our kids stay safe and healthy. Thanks. Chad? Hi, yes, I'm Chad Williams. I uh, am math, eighth grade math teacher at Deer Park Middle. Um, I'm pursuing my degree in uh, curriculum and instruction with a focus on technology. And uh, I was really, had a integral part with Deer Park's integration moving online. And so I'm really happy to be here and hope I can offer some insights um, going forward. Great, thanks. Mr. Kennedy? Uh, good morning, uh, Don Kennedy here, uh, the uh, Chief Financial Officer for CCSD. Heather? Hi, I'm Heather Burke, and I am a parent of a rising fourth grader at Beast Academy, and then I'm also a teacher at Stono Park Elementary. So um, I'm excited to be part of the team, and hopefully I can bring a unique perspective since I'm a parent and also a teacher in the district. Thank you. Mary? I'm Mary Carmichael. I'm the executive principal here at Charleston Charter School for Math and Science. We've, we serve 6th through 12th grade for, with kids from all over the county. It's a pretty diverse group and we're excited to be a part of uh, helping think through this and helping our other charter schools in the district think through what implementation will look like. And I'll just say it's been an honor to be able to brag about the district with my peers in other counties in, in South Carolina and even across the country, folks that I know and um, how responsive everybody has been at the district to help support each other. Thanks for all the work so far. Thanks, Mary. Mr. Barrowi? Yes, ma'am. For, for those that don't know me, I'm Jeff Barrowi, the Chief Operating Officer. And for those that don't know what's in oper what operations entails, uh, it's all the Bs. It's beans, bandwidth, buildings, buses, and, and we're proud to add Band-Aids uh, to, to, that, to that group. I see Ellen waving. Uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. So uh, information technology, buses, uh, transportation, I mean, um, building construction, building maintenance, uh, plant operations, uh, custodial grounds, nutrition services, uh, nursing, security. Um, that, that about covers it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Don. Hi, my name is Don Johnson. I'm on the MUSC board for the last uh, 25 years now, I guess. I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm a spine surgeon here in town, and um, you know, I'm a product of uh, public school teachers. My father was a 40-year assistant superintendent at Dorchester II, where my mother was a teacher. My uncle was a principal at St. George High, and probably what I should have led with is I'm the proud parent of a CCSD student, the, uh, the, the third in a line of uh, three great kids who've had a great education at CCSD. Thanks, Don. Uh, Kate? Um, hi, I'm Kate Darby and I'm the um, board vice chair. Um, my two children graduated from CCSD schools and I'm also very proud of the work that the CCSD team has done um, in the last three months. It's just been amazing and look forward to working with all of you. 
Wonderful. Um, I'm sort of losing track on the screen. Um, Dr. Williams? Great morning, everyone. I'm Joe Williams. I work with the middle schools here in the district and looking forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Um, Willa, I think I missed you. Good morning. I'm Willa McGirth Moody. Um, for the past 23 years, I have been at Mary Ford Elementary School. Um, working as a master reading teacher for the last few years. And this fall, I will be transferring to Sanders Clyde in the same role. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve in the task force. Great. Carolyn? Hi, I'm Carolyn Beltram, the Chief Academic Officer for Charleston County Public Schools. Uh, we're, I don't have a cute all be uh, thing like Jeff does. We do teaching and learning for the district. Okay. <laughs> Natalie. Good morning, everyone. I'm Natalie Ham. I am the district's general counsel. It's great to see you all here. Thank you for, for joining us and, and helping us um, support reopening and, and glad to be here. Thanks. Michelle. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michelle Simmons. I serve and support the elementary schools in the district and I'm pleased to be here. Jay. Morning, everyone. My name is Jay Whitehair. I'm principal at Lang Middle School of Science and Technology. And I just say it's an honor to be a part of this important work uh, to bring some sense of normalcy back to our children. Paul. Good morning, y'all. Uh, Paul Asper here, serve as vice president of commercialization for the uh, Zucker Institute for Applied Neurosciences based here in town. Um, also a product of public schools and a parent of a, a rising second grader and rising kindergartner. Important roles. Lauren? Hi, I'm a student at Early College High School. I'm a rising 12th grader. I'm also part of the Student Advisory Cabinet. And I think it's nice for me to be here to have a student's perspective on the issue. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, what's your home school? Um, I'd be Wando. Wando, and then, uh, but you attend early college high school full time. Yes, ma'am. Right, yeah. Okay, thanks. Are you with us, Tina? Yep, yeah, your audio cut out just in that particular moment. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Tina Worth. I'm with the Charleston Metro Chamber of Commerce, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, bring our business leaders into partnership to reactivate the schools. So happy to be here. Great. Mr. Darby? Yes, my name is Darby, and I am the principal of North Charleston High School, and I'm very appreciative of being a part of the task force, and I appreciate the leadership that Dr. Postlewit is evincing during these times. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Bill? Morning, everybody. I'm Bill Brigman. I'm the Chief HR Officer for the school district. Um, I don't have the extensive list like Jeff had as well, but I, I'm the people person. We have 5,500 or so employees. Um, very anxious to get back to some type of normal, whatever the new normal is. I'm looking forward to working with this task force. Thanks. Edward? Good morning, I'm Edward Boyd and I work with the district's Office of Strategy and Communication. Matt, you made it. I did, thanks. Uh, Matt Severance, uh, happy to be uh, joining this group. I um, am a hospital administrator by training and lead uh, MUSC's uh, system development and affiliation work. Um, so, uh, expanding the uh, the network, connecting with others across the state. Uh, one of the uh, things that I'm responsible for is business health, and we have uh, developed uh, a product called Back to Business that we are um, supporting uh, businesses, and we've also done some work or are beginning to do some work with uh, some of the colleges and universities across the state, but uh, supporting folks uh, getting back into action in a uh, COVID safe manner. And it, it involves a lot of uh, consultation by our uh, public health experts and a testing platform. And uh, work closely with uh, Dr. Ed O'Brien, who is also on this call. 
Thank you. Um, Dr. O'Brien, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself now? We'll come back. Uh, Tiffany? Good morning. My name is Tiffany Bush. I'm the parent of a five-year-old and a 12-year-old within the school district. I am a financial manager for DOD Spay War, well, formerly known as Spay War, now called NIWIC. I'm also a STEMS outreach mentor within the district. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you. Sherry? Hi, good morning. I'm Sherry Snipes Williams with Charleston Promise Neighborhood. We've been a partner with the school district for over 10 years, and I'm excited to continue this work. Great. Thanks. Erica? Hi, it's uh, Erica Taylor, Chief of Staff. Thanks. I think I've, I've gone around once. Um, uh, Dr. O'Brien, are you, I, I can see that you're on with audio. Can you hear us? Would you like to say a word or two? I, I just let him back in. I think he's uh, about to, to join. Um, it says it's joined. He's joining right now. Okay. Yeah, he, he texted me that his computer froze, so sounds like he's close. <laughs> okay. Um, Mrs. Darby? Was there anything you wanted to say? I said, you already got me. I said, hey, already. All right. Um, I just want to make sure I haven't missed anyone. It's a little bit difficult. Um, Dr. O'Brien, are you on now? Um, we'll go ahead and um, move on um, looking at where we left off on the slides. Dr. Postelay? <laughs> yes. There, there were there are a few members of the press who are a part of this call um, who are listening in. I just wanted to share that with you. All right, thank you. Uh, and yes, welcome. Um, we want to just um, take a few minutes. It feels awkward talking at you for so long, but we couldn't figure out any other way um, to give you context for what our system needs to think about as we contemplate a safe restart um, then um, by just getting through some of this, um, this complexity that we deal with. So uh, the slide that's on the screen now is intended to show that as we think about um, moving toward the safe restart, we have two main divisions we have to, to stand up, the instructional division and the logistical division. On the instructional side, we need to think about students and personnel. With students, one of the questions is, how many parents are ready for their children to return to in-person classes? Um, some of them will be ready for their children to return. Some of them will not be comfortable with that. So we also need to offer a K-12 virtual online school option. That will, that's different from being assigned to a, a classroom and having the teacher get on a, a Zoom call or, con, or Google Classroom or some other uh, connective, connectivity um, platform uh, for uh, uh, an hour or two or three a day. Uh, th this is, uh, would be an actual virtual online enrollment. Uh, which would be a separate enrollment from enrolling in school and being counted as a member of a teacher's classroom um, to be there in person. Um, we'll have the same issue with our personnel. We do anticipate that we will have a handful of personnel who uh, for um, because of their own health reasons or particular situations not be able to return to the workplace. Um, there's work to do sorting all that out. Um, as we move then down through the students, we'll have to figure out uh, what the schedules look like and what staffing look, looks like. Um, the scheduling then relies on some of the logistical issues that we have to worry about. In the facilities, we need guidance from the medical community regarding the proper physical distancing of kinds of work that we're undertaking with children and the various ages of children. Um, we have received guidance as of yesterday. Um, the 
uh, state is indicating we they think that we can transport approximately 50% of the children on a bus. Now, Mr. Burr will say a little bit more about that later, but um, the, the numbers of children who can be transported on a bus impact uh, um, our ability to, um, to get kids to school each day. We run uh, double transportation routes. So it's going to be possible to run um, an elementary plus a middle and high school route of a morning and then bring kids to school half a day, take them home and bring another group of kids to school for the other half day. That, that's simply not feasible for us. It isn't financially feasible and it isn't logistically possible. So when we go back over here and think about students, one of the things we'll need to find out from parents is if your child is planning to return to school, will she wish to ride the bus? And if they're going to ride the bus, then we have to figure out um, what's the articulation of the, the classroom schedule, the bus route, um, and um, the, um, the student arrival time as we think about the, um, the delivery of instruction. Under facilities, uh, we have a formula that we're using to um, determine how many students can be in a particular classroom space. We have to think about the sanitizing um, protocols that have to be in place uh, with our students. What are the health services that are available and what are the meal services that we provide? How do we do that? Um, when we think about students in a classroom, to the extent possible, can we leave students in a classroom and have teachers go from room to room to avoid moving so many students in the hallway? Um, at what grade levels does that seem to be feasible and where will that not work? Um, when we think about sanitizing, we also have to think about the buses in between runs, um, the school hallways, common areas, restrooms, playrooms. And then um, as I've mentioned, look at the number of students per bus, we also have to consider what that routing looks like and if it's possible if we're doing A and B days to um, have routes that we establish that are A day routes and routes that are B day routes. Um, so a lot of complexity to deal with um, that relies on accurate data getting entered into the system um, fairly quickly. It's not clear to us what date we will start. We think that the state is likely to approve an additional five instructors for children in grades K through eight. Um, if they do uh, approve those days, then we will likely start uh, students back the second week of August. That would give us a total of 185 instructional days with our K-8 students rather than 180. And of course, all of these actions have to be taken into consideration uh, considered um, with respect to uh, the additional cost because we know we will be reimbursed for some of our costs, but we will not be able to be reimbursed for all costs. And uh, we, some of the options that we might want to consider are actually cost prohibitive. So that's just a, a chart to give you an idea of the complexity with which we deal. Uh, so what we have to do is to um, instill confidence among staff, students, and parents that we have a plan that's a solid plan based on facts, based on um, the good advice that we have received from all of you um, and our teachers who are working to help put together the, the uh, possible plans for next year, that we will prioritize safety and health over everything else, that we have a plan uh, that is a firm plan to deliver effective learning. It might look different than it did in the past because we've got to zone in on the essential learning and we to take a look at the learning loss that occurred and design instruction that's intended to address learning loss. And then finally, we must um, be uh, uh, considerate of the fact that all of this work is done in partnership with parents and that our parents have many different um, situations, many different needs. Some of them may need for their children to, to be at school five days. They may need daycare for part of the time. Some of our parents may have households with um, some, a family member with compromised health. So they're going to their child to stay home and be able to take classes virtually. So we have 
helpful uh, as we move forward to take into consideration uh, needs today that didn't exist when we closed on March 13th. Um, some of the issues that we have to think about then, there are three big issues. One, recovery and the continuity of learning. Carolyn Belcher is going to talk just a little bit about uh, what, what we're thinking about in terms of this first big bucket as, uh, as it relates to recovery and learning. Thank you, Dr. Postaway. Um, as I think the key issue is that we know that there's been a long gap in learning for children while while we're hopeful that the virtual learning experiences um, were maximized as much as possible. We just recognize the face to face instruction is a is a much more comprehensive and it allows us to better manage and ensure consistency across the system. So our big challenge will be to make sure that we actually know kids are when they come back to school, figuring out through assessments where, um, where they're in a good place and where there are places where they're going to need additional support to accelerate instruction. I think our particular focus is going to be on those schools where we have students who are significantly behind. And part of what we're thinking about is can we provide additional programming and this extended day um, through other means to make sure that we're again accelerating instruction. Instruction. Um, the state has wisely helped us prioritize standards so that rather than try to teach everything at a surface level that we're teaching the key things and really teaching them in a deep way. Um, we're thinking a lot about how best given the physical constraints we may have depending on safety constraints of how to actually schedule face-to-face -face instruction as for as many kids as we possibly can for the full 180, maybe even more, if the state passes those five days, 185 days of instruction. Um, that could be a variety of approaches and we're interested to hear from this committee and what you think might be best for families or ways in which we can be more creative than we've considered on how best to configure our days and our instructional experiences. Um, we're putting more energy around professional development for teachers, particularly around meaningful virtual instruction. But again, there's also this question of acceleration. I think there's a lot in writing right now across the country about the learning gap. And the key question has been remediation and intervention versus acceleration. And I think that's important. Like, we don't want to look backwards too much. We want to make sure that we're starting where kids are certainly, but then really making sure that they're exposed to grade level content and that we're creating bridges for them on what they may have missed rather than go backwards, which might mean they will never catch up. And that's not what we would want. Um, I think for all of us, adults as well as students in the system, it's going to be important for us to think about how do we make sure that we help and create space for folks to process this, this trauma in a way. Um, many families suffered very differently, but certainly this has been a hard time for everyone. And we want to make sure that when we're back together in a school community, that we're thinking through how can we help create some space for children to have conversations to support each other and for adults to also get the support that they need in order to become as fully present as they can in school. And then finally, um, I, I regret to inform the parents on this call that our work is still going to require a lot of you, um, a different kind of lift, hopefully. But the idea would be that we need your help in supporting your children's learning. You know your kids best. What do we need to know about their experience that would help them in the classroom and you have to in learning at home? making sure that we're doing all that we can, again, to close those gaps um, and involve you in a meaningful way so that um, despite what uh, the entire country has gone through, that we're able to get to a place where kids are excelling again academically. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, the second big bucket then after we think about um, the, the whole instructional and learning um, strategies, the second um, bucket have to to think about are all of those logistical considerations that I um, uh, briefly mentioned on that chart. Uh, Mr. Borelli? Yeah. So uh, the first thing I want to mention on this slide is, is there will be some more information on logistics on a subsequent slide. So when I finish this, if you say, wait a minute, there's got to be more than that, uh, there's more coming. So this is just a preview uh, on this slide. The first thing I wanted to mention was that although on the pyramid diagram that talked about the, the two parts of the organization that are working up information to present to you all. Um, I, I will say that it's a lot more synchronized than that. Um, we have representatives on the learning services teams uh, to feed them information and also to hear what they're working on so that we can incorporate that into uh, some of the log logistical recommendations that cross the entire uh, breadth of, of this program. 
Uh, I, I did want to point out that we're actively uh, involved with other professional uh, organizations to hear what others are doing. Uh, and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing to say we're, we're not behind uh, compared to what others are doing. In fact, a lot of the ideas and, and, and things that we're doing to plan uh, and prepare solutions uh, are, are being taken into consideration from other school districts around, around the country. So uh, unfortunately, we're, we don't have a wheel uh, to not invent. Uh, we're, we're very much at the, at the forefront with, with other districts uh, around the country. and We will continue to stay engaged with them to pick up ideas uh, from other, uh, other school districts. Uh, we've got some great examples so far uh, behind the scenes, and, and maybe you all aren't aware of it, but there was a lot of effort put into uh, the things that have happened at the school so far. So whether it's the drop off and pick up of, of items between schools and parents and students, uh, whether it's the collection of belongings of, of students in schools to get those turned back over to um, turn back over to families, whether it's how we have come back to work so far, and whether it's the uh, in-person ceremonies that are that are coming up uh, very soon, uh, all of that there are there are uh, protocols that have been established and, and put in place that we'll be able to learn from uh, as we put together the plan to, to start uh, to start work. Uh, in addition to that. Uh, we are operating a small daycare uh, and have been since the 31st of March. Those have provided some great uh, lessons on uh, how uh, challenging uh, this has been and, and what might continue to be as we move forward in, in larger increments, uh, moving toward our, our summer semester program into, into the fall. Um, as far as specific considerations, I, I just wanted to point out a couple of things to give you some examples uh, across the board. Um, we've got HVAC listed there. Uh, one of the one of the options is to increase the filtration process of our systems, the the type of filters that are used. Uh, that re represents uh, not only a cost issue and a time issue, which we you know we could handle in some form or fashion, but we have to make sure that the systems continue to can continue to operate with that greater uh, filtration process. Uh, custodial, uh, when we talk about cleaning of, of buildings uh, before uh, the COVID shutdown. Uh, we had uh, developed um, a pretty good uh, number of uh, what we call foggers uh, that basically um, whole building uh, um, uh, systems that allow us to sanitize our schools. And we actually had implemented a process to uh, fog schools when we thought there was a potential for uh, COVID in a school. Uh, we're continuing to ramp up the procurement of those devices, and that would be integrated uh, into some decision down the road. So there's just two examples uh, within logistics that are that are being worked. And again, in a few slides, I'll talk a little bit more, more about what we've done. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> and, then, and then of course, um, there are the revised business practices. So um, Don Kennedy's on the call, the impacts of the pandemic on finances is a huge concern for us for all of you on this call. We have concerns about the additional costs as well as the redu reduced revenues. So um, um, I think this is something everyone on the call can relate to. Um, Don, did you wanna say anything else about that? Um, what I will say is that um, uh, we expect the school board to adopt the fiscal year 21 next year's budget uh, on January, excuse me, June 22nd. Um, However, the state uh, will not adopt this uh, budget for fiscal 21 until uh, the fall, probably September. And so the district will have to come back and have a revised budget in fall. And then during that time period, we'll have uh, between now and then more of an idea of uh, specifics around what the cost for reactiv reactivation will be. And so we'll uh, update, uh, update the budget at the time based on that additional information. Thank you, Don. And then we've mentioned a bit the uh, impacts of the pan pandemic on staffing, the personnel challenges we may have with our uh, immune compromised employees who may be some of our, our most stellar uh, classroom teachers, uh, but who may not be able to come back into the classroom and figuring out whether they can be part of the virtual school or, um, or serve in some other way but in the meantime we have to backfill into the regular classroom so there are going to be some unique personnel challenges that again uh, impact other employees similar. 
We will um, work on a contingency plan in the event there is a reemergence of the virus. And Erica Taylor and Edward Boyd are both on here. Know that our communication and engagement strategies will have to be different in the coming weeks and months in order to keep our communities connected um, so that we will be transparent and appropriately responsive. Moving on fairly quickly now, we want to give our um, health experts who are all today an opportunity to talk with us a little bit about their current uh, recommendations and considerations when it comes to health and safety. So I'll turn it over to you and um, others who may want to pitch in. Thank you, Dr. Postaway. So our main role at CCSD is to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 within the school community. So in order to do that, we look to um, DHEC and CDC for guidance for this. But what I want to make sure everybody on the call understands is that we can always do more than what um, DHEC recommends. And sometimes we may need to do that to reassure our families that the school is going to be a safe environment for them as well as for our staff. So some of the main highlights that we're looking for, looking at through our guidance is promoting healthy hygiene practices. As simple as this sounds, it is so important for us to remember all of these factors. Washing our hands with soap and water. We're gonna need to re, um, start our education again as soon as our staff comes back and as our students re-enter, making sure that we have virtual um, learning opportunities for them as well as some hands-on experience such as with our GlowGerm product that we had introduced in February and March. We, that's gonna be one of our main considerations. Wearing face coverings is, um, of course, it's recommended that all of our staff members wear a face covering, whether it be cloth or possibly um, a disposable mask. And we know that this is going to be a challenge. Um, also um, with DHEC, they are also looking at the possibility of our students wearing masks. Anybody above the age of two as well, as, and, and that would also include kids that were not able to um, take that mask off easily that they would not need to wear one. We are working very closely with facilities making sure that we have adequate supplies. It's such it is so important to make sure that we have everything that we need at the classroom level. And staying home when you're sick. As easy as that sounds, we all think that, you know, it'll be okay. So we really are making a huge effort with our employee logs, making sure that they do daily check-ins, uh, making sure they don't have any signs and symptoms or have been exposed to a COVID-19 patient in the past 14 days. And then we also need to be creative and thinking, how are we going to find out from each of our students that they do not have any of these signs and symptoms or have had any exposures? The next step that we have heard over and over again is promoting social distancing. Our biggest impact is going to be able to, where we can control things, is with cohorting. Cohorting is really that simply trying to keep the same teacher and group of kids together. Where before we might have had an exchange of classes that you know children would go down the hall to another classroom. Now what we would be doing to lessen those exposure risks would be having the teacher actually come into the classroom with the same group of students. Um, it, we could also involve staggered schedules with this, trying to just lessen the number of children that are in and out of classrooms at the same time whenever that is necessary. We're looking at spacing desk for distancing. This is going to provide a real challenge in a lot of different situations. When you look to the DHEC verbiage, they say increase space between desks. So where we've all heard the six foot distance, of course that would be optimal, but we may have settings, especially at our schools that have more at-risk learners, that we need to just look and think outside of the box a little bit. How could we put more children in this, 
in this setting safely. And that could be a task that, you know, we should discuss a little bit further. Again, avoiding group gatherings when we are, um, when we, you know, what we're used to getting together, doing assemblies and, and in different things and functions. Now we're going to have to think about how to do those virtually and simple things such as going to the cafeteria. Now we will be looking at having lunches within our classroom setting. So checking for signs and symptoms. Uh, we are um, looking, like I said before, we've had employee health logs that we have done, but we're gonna have to really think outside of the box about how to get those daily health checks for our students as well. So we could, we'll um, talk about some input with that. And um, temperature checks. And Dr. Richardson, you may wanna chime in with this one as well, but we have um, mm -hmm. DHEC at this point does not recommend that temperature checks be done on all persons entering a building. It would be for those medically fragile students at this point. And then I'll just go ahead and cover the testing. Um, right now, DHEC is saying that that simply just provides a snapshot if we are testing all of our staff. But I was very interested when Matt Severance um, had gone back and talked to some of the back to business um, information that he may have. And I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Matt, are you able to speak to that a little bit? Hi, uh, yes, this is Matt, and, and I'll ask uh, maybe Ed O'Brien, if you're on the line, Ed, to, to speak to the testing, if you can. Sure. Uh, thank you. Sorry about my uh, technical issues earlier. Uh, Ed O'Brien, I'm a physician at MUSC, uh, medical, uh, Chief Medical Officer of Business Health and Executive Director of MUSC Health Solutions, responsible for our community and statewide uh, COVID testing um, algorithms and, and testing centers. So, Yes, we can provide testing both on-site and off-site um, for active infection and antibody. Uh, we can do that, um, obviously, at cost. We're not, no one's making a profit. Um, we, we, you could, we could even look for some state funding to, to cover it. We'll, we'll see what we can do. But some of our back-to-business things are we actually send teams in, into the schools um, and, and walk through processes with your leaders uh, as well as your teachers or those who are at risk and say, okay, and really get granular and say, okay, the hand sanitizer should go here and not there, you know, put, move the desk to this side, you know, all that kind of stuff from kind of from start to finish. Things you might not think about, think cafeteria wise, um, you know, some laundry service wise things. I don't know if that happens at schools anymore, but um, all that kind of stuff we, we walk through, right? And what, what uh, should you be cleaning the rooms with? Where should those things go? What kind of mask are appropriate for, for um, different faculty versus students. Uh, so we do all that kind of stuff. And uh, we, we've, we've had some really, really good outcomes and, and people really uh, excited about the product. That sounds absolutely awesome. Um, that, that would be a partnership that we, I think would, would be very interested in um, having other people come and look to see what, you know, where we can improve to help to control any transmission. Great. And then we also, uh, what we would do is we would come and do an in-person evaluation. That's with our, uh, we have medical epidemiologists, public health experts, as well as um, trained uh, RNs and MDs. And we'd come through, do a walkthrough, and then we would uh, leave a liaison with the school district who could handle any mitigation of outbreaks or, or positive cases uh, throughout the year. That would be your point of contact. You could email them with questions and anything all throughout the time. Um, they, they would serve as your own personal Dr. Fauci kind of is the idea. <laughs> um, so that's something else we could provide. That, that sounds like a wonderful idea. So thank you, Dr. O'Brien. I appreciate that. And th this is Matt. J just to add, one of the, the things we've found around the state as we've been doing testing is, and, and I think the the group ought to anticipate this, you know, it, it, it could be a, an all or nothing where there's a, there's an uptick in disease and we need to pivot, but uh, more likely what we're seeing um, are hot spots. And, and so I, I think 
you know, we're going to need to be ready to pivot in a particular school or a, um, you know, particular area. Um, so, so, so we've got to be re ready for sort of a wholesale wholesale pivot, but also uh, a micro pivot uh, because because we we are seeing uh, hot spots emerge, um, and and so that may be the the reaction that needs to happen. Very good. Dr. Richardson, do you have anything to add? Sorry, I was having, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was having some trouble getting off uh, mute last time. I don't, I think that, you know, that sounds like a wonderful partnership. If MUSC can, can provide some of that sort of boots on the ground in the, uh, in the schools themselves, um, we will certainly be working with MUSC and have continued to, and, and will continue to work with um, your school district and others in the region um, for um, for helping you to sort of apply the DHEC guidelines. And, and the DHEC guidelines are also changing. Um, as someone said earlier, um, we're very much looking at other states and other school districts um, around the U.S. and around the world and, and sort of um, bringing back those best practices. So, uh, so just know we're, we're here as a partner and uh, you've already done lots of great work. You certainly have a, a wonderful health leader in Ellen Nitz and okay. what she's um, been doing for the district. And, um, and I'm just, I'm happy to be a part of this and I'm happy to, to serve as a resource at any time. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And just kind of rounding things out, one of our biggest things that we need to remember is that we're going to need to adopt a new culture for our school. And in order to get people to buy into all of these things that we are saying are so important, I would like for us to always think about, I protect you and you protect me. And that goes with everything from the hand washing to especially wearing the mask. And this is a cultural change and it's going to take a lot from each person, but it can be done and we need to implement these, these practices to make sure that we have a safe environment for our students and staff. Thank you, Ellen and team. Um, it sounds as though we're forming or beginning to form a solid subgroup of medical professionals who will confer and form an advisory group and perhaps even um, train the trainers, train a team of people with Charleston County Schools so that we know, uh, our team knows um, the, the proper protocols or the more um, uh, nuanced um, uh, parts of uh, furniture placement or sanitizer placement or all those kinds of things that, that years of training have taught you um, to um, to look for in order to maxi maximize the effectiveness of our efforts. Um, we have just two more slides that we want to talk about um, briefly and then uh, the rest of the time is for the group's participation in um, helping us decide uh, appropriate next steps. Uh, Mr. Baroa, you were going to talk a little bit more about uh, the details and the operational issues. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think the, the follow on to what the medical community just passed along, I think is a, a great way to segue into um, the challenges that we face. Uh, you know, I heard the comment about consideration or, and, and, uh, and having kids wear masks. Uh, even, the, even the DHEC guidance, and I'll, and I'll read it directly, consideration may be given to recommending them for students. So we've got a lot of hard decisions to make. And um, although the school year is, is far, seems to be far off, um, the decisions of where to place hand sanitizers, how to line up classrooms is something that has to happen relatively quickly. Uh, number, one, number one, we have um, a summer semester. We're looking at kicking off on the 6th of July. And when we talk about furniture moves, um, we have to put that stuff somewhere. <laughs> if it can't stay in the classroom. So there's a lot of things that happen, happen, have to happen quickly. And I did want to provide some details of things that have been done so far. So as far as classroom capacity goes, we have a building operating capacity matrix for all of our schools. Uh, it's based on taking a look at how schools are being used, 
uh, what we can put in each classroom. And we've basically taken that, that typical building capacity uh, and developed it into a COVID capacity, which, which essentially left us at about 60% of what we normally provide. Uh, now, each individual school could be looked at, and it may vary up or down a little bit uh, based on how some of the specialty classrooms are, are used. But that nominal capacity uh, has been passed along to our academic leaders as they look at different options on how to bring as many uh, possible kids back to school uh, that, that, we, that we can. Uh, each of our departments has developed a reactivation summary. Uh, those summaries uh, summarize the things that they need to do, uh, the challenges that they may have, uh, the financial implications that they may have. Uh, those are being, being finalized. Uh, I'm not prepared to, to, to show those yet. I'm still scrubbing those, but we want to basically um, bring those into the, dis into the discussion of the different things we have out there. I mentioned some of those challenges on, on a slide previous. Uh, I can give you a couple more right now that, that people may not be thinking about. Um, nutrition service is a great example. I heard, um, hey, let's just have all the kids eat in the classroom. Um, from a safety perspective, that sounds great, but could they eat in the cafeteria in a safe manner to allow them to get out of their classroom, uh, to allow them to, to reach, to stretch out a little uh, from sitting in the classroom all day? So that still may be a consideration. And from the nutrition services perspective, it's an increase in cost to package up meals to take them to classrooms. So that, that is something that, that we want to work into, into the equation as we move along. Um, from a bus transportation perspective, the superintendent mentioned, uh, DHEC came out with guidance earlier this week uh, saying a max capacity of 50%. And so that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't go less than that. Uh, with a 50% with a capacity, that doesn't give us six foot social distancing. We'll have to look at whether or not that risk is something we're worth taking. Um, and are there any adjustments within that? So that's an, another example of things that are, that are happening from uh, a department perspective. Uh, we have developed a, what we call it a menu of items. Uh, so if disinfection uh, rates are gonna be increased, of, of HVAC filter rate, uh, rates are gonna be increased, uh, we've basically developed across our 84 schools what that would cost to increase uh, the different uh, types of services that we provide so far so that as decisions are be being made, they can be made with eyes wide open on, on how much it would cost the district because out of the general operating fund, um, whatever we spend on that uh, comes out of the entire budget, uh, which could potentially impact uh, learning, learning services as well. Uh, the last thing I wanted to pass along is that uh, Ellen mentioned uh, the, su the supplies and, and PPE that we're going to need to procure. Uh, we have a once a week meeting to keep a close eye on gloves, masks, hand sanitizer, uh, other um, items that are, that are being pushed out into the, uh, into the service community now that might be effective in, in analyzing those uh, items as well as the cleaning equipment used by our custodial staff. So we're keeping a close eye on that. Uh, we're expending resources where we think we're gonna need them at this point, uh, because some of those items are indeed long-term items uh, and are hard to get. Uh, I will tell you that as an example, um, I challenge any of you to find a two liter or one gallon pump bottle of hand sanitizer. Um, I had a guy come into us uh, offering to sell them to us in old vodka bottles. I, I don't know if he was, using the remnants of the alcohol in there to, to, to get his 80% or his 70%, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the, the larger bottles of hand sanitizer are the, are the hot commodity right now um, in, in the world. And so we're, we're keeping a close eye on that and stocking up where we can on items that we know we're gonna need uh, come this fall. So I, I could go on and on, uh, but I'll, I'll turn it back over to Learning Services. All right, thanks, Jeff. So happy Friday, everyone. Uh, this one is definitely a TGIF exclamation point, but we made it through. So um, from a learning services standpoint, um, our thought process was that um, in order to make sound decisions surrounding our safe start, we needed to some feedback from our stakeholders, more specifically our parents and our teachers. And so with that being said, we have uh, tasked our school leaders with uh, administering surveys to both those they started last week with the first round of surveys and it should end up this week, which is today. And we're also gonna to be soliciting feedback throughout the summer. Uh, 
some of those questions from the surveys for parents um, involve some of the things Dr. Postway mentioned earlier about comfort level with their scholars returning to school, transportation issues they may have, other things of that nature. And for our teachers, some of the same things, but more with them, you know, about the virtual piece, you know, things we can self-reflect on, how we can improve that, if that's the decision for next year um, uh, for the safe start. Um, once we receive this data, of course, we're going to analyze it and use it as one of the pieces to help drive this. So that's basically um, all we have to say about the parents and the teacher survey. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Simmons to talk about the scheduling options that we've uh, been going through as well. Thank you, Joe. Um, just wanted to mention briefly, for the last few weeks, we've had three small groups of central staff members and principals working concurrently on thinking through designs, schedules, and the potential, um, just operating under the understanding that we may enter the fall um, having to make a staggered schedule and make some adjustments to what we know to be typical school. And so the first group, um, they're thinking through an AB schedule. What would like if we had students who um, attended school on a Monday, Wednesday, and a Tuesday, Thursday rotation, and thinking about Fridays as an opportunity to consider our students need acceleration, who might need intervention, and so they may be given targeted opportunities. We had a second group who looked at tracks, um, whereas I have students coming on a weekly basis. So I may come on an A um, schedule for one week and then the next group, which would be B, would come the following and we will continue to rotate there. Looking at what looking at what the opportunities are there, what are the challenges and what are the logistical implications. And then at the high school level, um, again, because high school has its own unique needs, thinking about what their semesters would look like, thinking about perhaps summer um, work, the way that Trident Technical College might look at their schedules. And so I have to emphasize that these are just considerations, currently preliminary um, thinking opportunities about what would have to happen if we had to make um, adjustments to all students not being in the building at one time. And that's what I have, thank you. Thank you, and all of that is just to give you uh, some idea of the work that is going on. Um, uh, this is our final slide. We will connect again with you on Friday, June 26th. Um, we have two additional Fridays lined up there. Uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of these decisions uh, wrapped up by July 10th. But when we connect again on the 26th, we hope to have information that will give us some guidance or some indicators on, uh, with respect to, to uh, parent and teacher preferences. Uh, we should have the guidelines that the state is going to issue uh, regarding school start back, um, as well as uh, updated guidelines from DHEC and perhaps the Accelerate Ed effort that is led by the governor. Um, hopefully, we'll have more definitive information about a specific start date in August. Uh, we will know the schedule that our teachers and principals feel is feasible uh, based on feedback we've been given. And we think it would probably be helpful, uh, and this is where we need your input, to start creating a frequently asked questions document so that um, people who uh, don't have a good way to get information who have questions can find the answers or pose the question and make us aware that it's one we should have considered and haven't yet. So we are at uh, the final stage of this meeting where we hoped to reserve 30 minutes for um, those of you who are not with Charleston County Schools to share your thoughts, suggestions, your ideas, concerns, um, and basically your um, um, your advice about how we might improve our efforts to have a safe, smooth restart that meets the needs of as many of the individuals in our district as possible. So thank you for that lengthy, for your patience during that lengthy um, entry discussion. We won't need to do that again today, again with the kickoff and setting the context. So. For those of you who've been listening, um, the floor is open. 
Um, uh, hi, I'm Ija. I'm a high schooler. I'm a 10th grader. And I have a question. Yes. Um, Y'all are considering the mask and stuff, um, but like, what about gloves for students? I know that you're doing like the t six feet thing and stuff and moving desk, but students are students and you turn your hand for five seconds and they're already touching <laughs> and coughing out loud without covering their mouth, sneezing and stuff. So one person could spread it to like five people in one week. So I was just saying. All right. So um, you, uh, in addition to masks, you would like us to consider the option of gloves for students. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Got it. Thanks, Egypt. And I didn't ask you what your home high school is. Huh? Like, what's my name? Like, what's, what's, your, high school? What, what's your home high school? Garby Saul. Oh, you go to Stahl. Are you at Early College as well? No, I'm not. No, you're at Stahl full time. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Postaway, this is Kate Darby. Um, on the one hand, as I was listening to you all talk, I'm amazed by the work that you all have been able to get done on this and, and the community members too, while you've also been, you know, providing school and meals to all um, our, our 50,000 students. On the other hand, it also made me a little sad to, to listen to all of the changes that we might have to make. And, and some, some, are, some I think are fine, um, probably things we ought to be doing with um, you know, keeping our hands cleaner and as I have mine on my face, but um, but I just wonder with some of the research that I've seen recently and, and we, about kids not being the non-symptomatic carriers and I mean we've gotten letters from people who are saying just you know open schools up as normal and I, I don't think we need to do that but do you feel like you're gonna the, the guidelines and the suggestions from DHEC are going to get stricter, get lessened? What, what are you guys feeling on that? I mean, and, and do we have to follow exactly what DHEC and the state say, or are those guidelines? Dr. Richardson, do you want to address um, DHEC's point of view? Um, so, Kate, I'm not sure how DHEC's guidelines will change in the future. I think they'll very much be tied to the data to mm -hmm. see what happens both here with our infection rates and as other countries and other states go, do begin schooling again. And as we look at what's happened in some countries that never actually stopped schooling, um, I do think there's some initial data that says that, that schools reopening has not had the effect on infection rates that we fear. Um, that's certainly good news, um, but that's very preliminary um, based on very small, um, you know, numbers of places that have opened up. But I think the issue is not just the kids, but it's the staff and the families at home um, that the kids are going back um, to. And so, you know, and then to, to answer your question about the DHEC guidelines, I do think that they're guidelines. Um, we are certainly, you know, here as a state agency to support what you're doing, um, but we do um, very much um, base our guidelines on the evidence out there. And so, um, so although they, they are guidelines, um, we do feel strongly until we have more evidence um, that suggests that we will move in a different direction uh, about them. So did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. That does, that does. Yeah, sure. Could we this is Mary Carmichael. Could we possibly get some kind of numbers on the child care capacity in the county and even really the surrounding counties? As we know, a lot of our teachers can't afford to live in Charleston County, so daycare in Somerville is even going to impact what we're able to do in the county. We know even before all of this happened, there were at least two or three child care centers that closed in Charleston County. Um, 
you know, that first six months of school last year that impacted some of our teachers and teachers in other schools as well. So I think that that number is going to have a huge impact on us um, across the county and staff returning, other things. We'll work on that, Mary. Um, to make sure I understand, are you talking about daycare for preschool children or daycares um, who that might be willing to take children uh, who are elementary age on off school days? Or yeah, it might, it, both, honestly. So that's, yeah, the, the first part is truly just those traditional kids that are in a childcare setting. We know a lot of our teachers and employees have kids that are under five that are in child care centers um, typically. And are they gonna open up at just half capacity as well? That will be devastating to the number of people that are able to come back to work too. And then um, are there, is there truly capacity or are there vacant spaces that we can co-opt into becoming some other kind of space for that, those extra kids that 50% of our population is not in the schools if they're not able to be at home where can they be? Thank you. Um, Paul, the, what's the business community's um, view of the, of the relationship between schools restarting and employees being available to come back to work? Is there one, is that one of the key, uh, is that a key um, consideration as you think about the economic drivers or is that um, a lagging sort of consideration? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a crack at that and we'll just say that I don't uh, presume to, to be able to speak for the entire business community, but, but certainly there are a lot of parents who depend on um, school for uh, child care uh, for a big chunk of the year. And, and that has been a huge burden, both, you know, certainly on, on parents in real time, but also in terms of uh, businesses being able to get people back to work or back to work kind of in a full-time capacity or, or man, even just on the, on kind of the softer side of it to, to have employees full attention uh, throughout the week. I mean, I just, Think about my personal experience, and we're a family who's extremely fortunate to, uh, we're both working parents, full-time working parents, um, and we're juggling home, you know, uh, I, I'd give us sort of middling scores uh, at best on our homeschool performance, but uh, certainly our ability to focus on on our day job and to contribute to our organization's sort of objectives was heavily diminished. And I anticipate that that will continue to be the case until we, until when or if we can figure out creative ways to, uh, you know, keep, keep kids safe and healthy in the cases where they aren't in the classroom and, and learning when they aren't in the classroom or in some other setting like that. Thank you. Tina, uh, has your organization had conversations about um, this issue? Is Tina still with us? Any other post, but I don't, I don't see her. I'm looking one more time. I don't, I don't see her. Yeah, she's. Um, so it's, a, it's an issue for our own employees, too, who have children who are saying, if I'm teaching on a day and my child is here on a day, um, I, I'm going to need some help um, with, with B day. So that, that's something we're looking at um, as well. Um, in what, what are the capacities and possibilities? We've had some um, faith-based groups reach out to offer space. Uh, and we have um, uh, a kaleidoscope team of um, before and after school care providers who um, provide that care on a sliding fee scale uh, who are interested in looking at, at how might be able to help fill gaps. Um, so I put that on the list as one of the things we need to think about. Well, uh, Dr. Dr. Postaway, 
Yes. Are, um, are after school programs going to happen in the fall? Do you have a sense at this point? Um, I think Jeff might have said a, a word or so about that. Uh, Jeff, do you want to revisit that? Well, I, I will say I, I, I believe the answer is yes. Um, the after school program uh, under Mr. Sacker and under Learning Services has developed a, a pretty incredible plan uh, for summer, summer programs, which I believe can be applied to after school, after school starts. Now we'll see when we start that in July, how, how effective it is. Uh, the capacity in the fall may be less than it usually is, but they put together, a, I believe, a very good plan uh, that um, represents a phenomenal safety protocol and, and we'll see how, how effective it is. And I, I believe we're, 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 we will be able to run after school programs, albeit the capacity may be, may be limited. There will be, I think, some challenges as folks could probably infer for the number of students we're serving, we would need to have, the, the, we would serve half the number of students or about that for the same staff. So that is a revenue center for us, or at least it's cost neutral. So I think one of our challenges is how could we find philanthropy and or um, public monies that we can reroute to subsidize, because I think there is a financial challenge in how we actually cover them. We can logistically do it, and we certainly aim to do it. It's just going to be a question on the finance side. Right. Dr. Postman, one thing, thing that I found interesting, I thought daycares had all closed, but and I'm sure some did, but they, a lot of them stayed open. So I, I'd wonder, not for an answer today, but if all these daycares stayed open and their children are there, how did, you know, did they have hot spots? Were their, are their children there sick or are they all fine? And is that something we should be looking at as we, as we open schools? Thanks. Uh, Dr. Postaway, uh, with regards to the survey, I can give you some of the numbers uh, from my parents. I surveyed 833 parents. That's over 75% of our family. 90, over 97% of the families pl plan to return to CCSD. 60% uh, uh, prefer in-person. 35% prefer a combination of both. Less than 5% want just virtual learning, and 70% plan on district provided transportation. I know that's a small sample size for the district, but it does represent 75% of my school, so it might be a perspective there. Thank you, Jay. That's very helpful. And that is um, Lang Middle School, is that right? Yes. I that could. Is, yes. Yeah. So if I can comment, I, I, Jay's last comment was, was really, really pointed to me, uh, and I really appreciate that 70% comment about transportation. We typically run less than 50% of our children on buses. Our, inter our survey of parents, we received um, 16,000 results back, and 60% and said they would use buses. You're saying 70. So it's interesting, despite this, um, despite this crisis, more families seem to be interested in putting their children on buses, which is, is interesting. Let's just say it's interesting. It, it's going to be a challenge if that indeed ends up happening uh, and we have much more kids than we normally have uh, on our buses. Right. Um, any other comments, questions, suggestions? Um, um. I, have a, I have a question if I could. I've, I've uh, I've looked at the guidelines from the South Carolina High School League. Right. And I know there are other districts. It's a, it's a guideline that allows it to be interpreted on a district basis. Right. I'm just curious what CCSD is doing with it since I guess it's getting to be football season soon. And so, um, of course, the guidelines cover a number of sports, most of which are summer, fall activities. And I've just not heard anything from CCSD in terms of how they're interpreting the guidelines from the high school league. So uh, Natalie Ham, uh, our general counsel has been working on that. Jeff Barrowi and um, uh, some folks on his team 
working. Uh, I've been in touch with Dorchester 2, Dorchester 4, and Berkeley to see if we can all um, uh, move in, 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 in the same direction with that. We know that Berkeley is going to start, I believe, um, June 8th, and that Dorchester 2 and Charleston are hoping to start the uh, practices the week after that, but I know that uh, Natalie Ham and her folks are working on the, the legal aspects of the releases that have to be signed and Jeff and his team are working on the logistics. So Natalie and Jeff, do you want to say any more about that? Uh, th that's exactly right. So we are working, um, it looks as if we're going to have a waiver both for uh, students to participate and possibly coaches. We're working through that process now. We're hoping to um, continue to coordinate with the other local districts to make sure that we're pretty much all aligned in how we do things. Um, our waivers may look a little bit different from each other, but they'll have basically the same level of information in them. Um, and we're just now trying to, to figure out kind of what to do with um, volunteer coaches, since they're not um, obviously CCSD employees. I think that's the part of the process that we're on right now. But Dr. Postaway is spot on. Jeff's team is um, working through the logistical part of it, is my understanding. And we are hoping to be able to um, allow some, some level of um, training to start the week of the 15th. Yeah, I'll just add, we're fortunate that the phase one implementation are, are groups of 10. Uh, groups of 10 are much more easy to manage. Uh, but as, as Natalie mentioned, identifying uh, masks, hand sanitizer, uh, digital thermometers, uh, all of that has been, been worked on to make sure that we're, we're a go from a logistics side uh, before, before the, the plan's ready to be implemented. Did that address your question? Thank you. You're Dr. welcome. Dr. Postaway. Yes, sir. Uh, when, when do you project um, a plan will be finalized to roll out to parents in the community so that as we are moving forward to uh, the opening of school, parents will have a better opportunity to, uh, to plan and to know exactly what to expect as we move forward. And I understand that we'll, we will be tweaking this as we go along the way, but uh, when, do, when do you project we will be able to put something out? Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, we have to wait for some of the decisions that um, the state makes. We don't have the right to make a decision um, expenditures of CARE Act funds, for example. The um, state superintendent of schools is going to put some guidelines. There'll be guidelines, but there'll be strongly recommended guidelines in place that she, she hopes to have to us by the end of next week. But our target date um, is July 10th. We have a meeting with this group on July 10th, and that's our target date to present the draft of the final plan. We would hope to have it finalized that day so that parents still have um, the two weeks of July and the first week of August to get ready for school in the event that our students um, do have the opportunity to come back to school the second week of August. So um, July 10th, our um, aspirational date and July 24th is our, our, our um, absolute deadline. So I, I do ask that as we put plans together that we keep a, cute, uh, a few factors in mind. Um, and that being, uh, we do have uh, single parents uh, that has been struggling over the course of the time, uh, just trying to educate their kids at home remotely. Uh, and as we prepare to go back into school, just keep in mind that there are a number of kids uh, that were already behind and trying to, uh, to learn and understand the curriculum. And as we move forward now, even into going into uh, a new school year, maybe half days, maybe kids still remaining at home, uh, we just need to be very mindful uh, of those particular kids that, that may be falling even further behind. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, and we've said it a number of times, uh, there are a number of kids that rely on meals that they are not 
uh, readily uh, privileged to uh, as they would get when they come to school. So uh, we just need to keep those things uh, in mind as we're preparing and planning for the reopening of school. And I understand uh, the social distancing part and I understand uh, the capacity of transportation on the bus. I understand all of that. Uh, uh, we just need to, to make sure that, that those uh, rural single parents uh, that, are, that are struggling right now uh, uh, as we prepare to move into the, to the new school year. Thank you. Carolyn or Jeff, do you want to address that in any way? Well, I, I, going back to our, our menu of items, one of the things we are taking a hard look at, to, to your point, Reverend Mack, is, uh, is how do we continue to feed all kids like we would feed them if they were at school every day? And, and that will be one of the items that the calculation has been made that shows to deliver X amount of meals to X amount of homes if kids aren't in school, or create a shelf-stable meal that they can take home with them when they're in school, the cost of, of that increase as well. So Nutrition Services is anticipating, or, or they're, they're hoping to be able to provide the same level of service they do if the kids were in school every day. They'll, they'll just be a menu item that we'll have to choose from on what the, what the, school, di you know, the school district wants to do. So sp spot, on, uh, spot on with that. Agree. As you know, Dr. Reverend Mack, we're worrying a lot about making sure that we're paying attention to the equity agenda that the board had already outlined and that we're continuing in that work despite the, at, at, I'll say, distraction of the, the virus. So um, work on the acceleration schools, making sure that we're thinking in terms of more time for the students who are furthest behind. And, it, you know, I, I, my stomach went a little worried when I heard late July as a possibility for when we were because we would we have quite a lot of work to do to do round programming and once we finalize the schedule to make sure that there are things like extended day with tutoring that there's supports in place if we do need to have a, a partial virtual option I, I think this group probably knows this the educators among us would like to open in a normal way too but we want to make sure we do that so that no one's uh, no students knows no parents or grandparents are hurt and are ever safe so part of this is the challenge of planning for multiple uh, models and wanting all of them to have equity at their core to make sure that we're responsible to the families you're most worried about, sir. And if Thank I could you. just add one, one more, I didn't talk about this in, in my discussion, but to Reverend Mack's point of making sure that if, if we don't have kids at school, what, what are we doing to help? If, if we end up having some type of virtual option, uh, whether it's a day at home, two days at home, something like that, uh, we, obviously, we obviously realized that we were short with Wi-Fi coverage uh, we have a number of households that don't have Wi-Fi. Kids couldn't get to the buses. Kids couldn't get to a school to get to that Wi-Fi so they could get on their Chromebook. Uh, we're working to develop an agreement, uh, again, another menu item that we could bring back forward for approval to get um, a, a cellular capable device uh, into our students' hands uh, of the 2,000 plus that didn't have that capability. Uh, again, leading toward what, what do we make sure, what can we make sure we do to make sure that Although they may not be in school, they, they have a, a compatible device, they have a meal, everything that goes with it. Uh, we're, we're looking at those options as, as well from the IT perspective. Great. How about um, from parents who are on the call? Uh, I haven't heard um, questions specifically that parents may have. I'd like to give them an opportunity before we reach our, our uh, closeout time. Um, if I may, yes. I, I have a, I'm a teacher, Chad Williams at Deer Park Middle, and I do have a four-year-old that was supposed to enter in a 4K program. And I guess my question is, is, have we done any surveys for parents that are willing to send their kids um, and risk, you know what I mean? Like if, if we're wearing masks and if we have the N95 mask, which supposedly is 90% effective for the transmission of the virus. And then we have sanitation protocols. Like, do we know if parents are okay with sending their kids? Like, is that a survey we've asked? I can address that, Dr. Post. Wait, uh, uh, Chad, this is Dr. Williams. Uh, one of the questions does ask about the parents' comfort level with uh, returning their child to school next year. Okay. Okay. And I guess my, my point is, is, you know, if, if I know as a parent that we're wearing masks and we're sanitizing, 
I'm okay with that risk because I've heard that from doctors that the vaccine is only going to be about 50% effective. But if we're wearing masks and we're sanitizing, that's even cloth masks is 70% effective. And so that's as effective as we could possibly get unless we're getting those really high end masks to all the kids. And so as a parent, I'm, I'm seeing that risk and I'm like, that's, that's about as good as I think we can do. And I'd be willing to send my kid in at capacity if we're doing all those protocols. Thank you. Any Thank other you. questions from someone who hasn't had a chance to talk or um, one of the experts on the call who's um, um, realized there's uh, something we're forgetting about or there's a, um, something you know about that might be of, of use to us? I have a question real quick. Yes, please. Um, so my school, we do college classes. So we go into the our college campus with other college students. And I know other schools will send kids to like uh, College of Charleston. Is there any way you have a plan to manage any kind of sanitation between that? You know, Lauren, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, knowing Vanessa Denny, knowing your principal, um, she has three different plans, uh, plus a contingency plan to deal with that. But, uh, but I personally don't know. Uh, uh, Joe, Michelle, or Carolyn, do you know? I, I can comment real quick. I know you didn't ask me, but uh, <laughs> early early college is an anomaly. Uh, early college, the early college campus is managed and operated by Trident Tech. Um, we would we always have relied on their cleaning process. So it 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 prompted me to ask the question: What are they going to do when they open? And will it meet the same expectations we have for our schools? And do we need to supplement that? So I, I really appreciate the question and comment. And, and I'll, it's something I'm going to go back and take a look at. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. <clears throat> hey, this is Paul. I had uh, one, one more quick one. And if, if we're out of time, maybe it's just one to sort of provoke some thought. I, one of my questions is sort of around surveillance and, and what are the measures that CCSD will be keeping their eyes on as we go forward, both in terms of certainly, hopefully not, but, but potentially making a decision at a system level or a, a local school level that uh, we need to tighten up, but maybe even on the positive side, like what are the measures that we might be looking at to say, uh, based on what we're seeing, we might even be comfortable opening up more and moving back more towards a more traditional model uh, so what are those measures that we'll kind of be keeping an eye on as we go forward? That's a great question. And um, to be honest, that's something I'm hoping that MUSC and DHEC will help us with, um, the metrics. Um, do we set the parameters now um, for moving, uh, um, adjusting our actions in either direction? Uh, uh, we talked about a contingency plan. If we have another viral infection that causes us to shut down, but we didn't really talk about um, what those metrics are, um, how they apply to individual schools, what sort of data systems and spreadsheets we set up um, to monitor and who's responsible for that. So that's on my list of things to take up with, um, frankly, the folks at MUSC, hoping that as part of their research efforts, there may be something that um, is uh, easily adaptable to help school district and to fit some of the work that MUSC is doing. Um, Matt, I don't know if that's anything or Dr. O'Brien would want to address now. No, I, th I think that'll be good work to, to undertake. Uh, we do have a, uh, a dashboard that we, we publish the, uh, the one region reignite group that, uh, that you mentioned at the beginning of the call uh, is using this dashboard, and I can I can send you a link to it. It's it's refreshed every uh, every week, um, so it, it it you know in an as is state, it'll provide good um, uh, broad community metrics to look at that that will be guiding the. Um, the community in general, I, I think, um, so that, that'll serve some of your need, uh, but, but there will be, uh, I think there'll be a need uh, that'll be more specific to 
the school district and, and maybe individual schools. So we, we, that, that's a discussion we need to have. But I, I can forward you the dashboard that currently exists, and you can see those metrics and uh, um, some of the, the thresholds that have been set. It's a um, green, yellow, red uh, dashboard. This, this, is, this is Don, I'll jump in here also. Um, there's also a, everyone has seen the COVID curve. Um, it, there's various different models nationwide. The IHME model is the one that you'll see quoted. And at the medical university, we actually have our own version, if you will, that's locally based, uh, done by uh, one of our epidemiologists, Dr. Uh, Wiley. So we'll be able to use that also. I think that curve is probably the fastest, easiest way to see where we're going. The other thing just to throw in here, and this is, uh, this won't change the conversation one way or the other, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, if nothing else, uh, to hear this. I heard Chad's comment as a concerned parent. As I said, I have a parent, I have a, a child, ninth grader, CCSD also, but at the Children's Hospital, uh, since our first admission of an adult, which was March 12th, the Children's Hospital has had one patient admitted with a primary diagnosis of COVID. I talked to the medical director last night. Now, we've had a couple other patients there that were asymptomatic that were admitted for other reasons. They got tested and, and were positive, but they were otherwise asymptomatic. But in terms of an ill child with COVID, we've had one patient. So I think that helps you, should help you, I think, somewhat with perspective in terms of children being sick, being ill, and coming to the Children's Hospital. Thank you. We are- I, Dr. Postaway, if I could add to, from the school perspective of managing, we, um, all of my school nurses, which we have about 100 school nurses throughout our schools, that we will be using electronic medical records that have been updated that will also include a COVID um, trending and tracking base, which is very nice. And in the past, we've worked very closely with DHEC with influenza-like illness that we've been able to run reports and do biosurveillance for that as well. And working hand in hand with them, you know, we feel like we've been able to manage that quite well with this new update in our records i think that we'll see that it's going to be able to provide that snapshot on a daily basis of what's going on in all of our schools thank you um uh we're five minutes over time or perhaps seven minutes over time now um i want to thank everyone for joining us this morning um, we hope that when we meet again we will have more of a plan um, that is um, something we can send to you before the call so you will have had time to look at it and respond to it and we can begin um, um, refining uh, from a draft that's, that's ready to, um, to iterate on the next time we meet. Um, and Carolyn, I your admonition about uh, July 10th being just about the latest that learning services staff could manage. So uh, that gives us four weeks to uh, get all of these details ironed out that we're connecting uh, with parents and teachers in a, a very significant way. Um, thank you again, all of you, uh, Dr. Richardson, uh, the folks from NUS, parents, principals, teachers, the parents, of uh, um, the business community folks who've taken time to join us and our board officers. This is really important work. Um, we wanna get it right. And we don't have any models as Jeff mentioned to, to work from yet. There are others that are in the development stage, but uh, we're, we're in the um, early days of trying to figure out this prototype of what the first start back plan looks like with the understanding that we're going to have to, to stay nimble uh, and adjust as conditions change and we learn more. So again, many thanks to everyone. We will be in touch with you hopefully uh, before we connect again in two weeks.